So what we're going to do is that we're going to look at what, what does this mean, mental health, mental illness, right? So uh, Port Anita, as an advocate in promoting awareness on mental health, tell us more about um, why you started Miasa. You know, what was missing uh, or available but inadequate in Malaysia that made you feel that we needed something like a Miasa? So please go ahead and share that with us. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And a very good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Noriza, Noriza uh, for the introduction. Um, Assalamualaikum, Chief Wan Sarima, and also QM. Um, nice having you guys together this morning. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so uh, a little bit about um, Miasa and also what was missing, yeah, to answer your question during the time. Um, so first and foremost, for the for everyone's information, I am a person with lived experience. Um, so I am a person with a mental health condition. Um, so that would be the first reason why um, the conceptualization of Miyasa came about. Um, I, you know, eight years ago when I was diagnosed with a mental health condition, I felt um, really alone in my struggles, um, not knowing anyone else who had the condition. Um, I have never heard um, of a mental health disorder in that sense. Um, and so the feeling with this condition really compounded um, the feelings of hopelessness um, and also the struggles that I was uh, going through, uh, which made it very challenging for me to see, to see a way out. Um, so you, you feel very trapped um, in your brain in this condition with really no hope um, of recovery. So what happened was um, after going through the whole recovery process and I crossed over to recovery, I wanted to create a platform where if possible, dengan izin Allah, nobody would have to go through what I went through. Um, and I wanted people to feel you know, safe that there was hope to their recovery and um, for them to get the, the help that they needed um, at the onset of the condition, right? But more of providing non-medical alternatives. So I had the condition that I brought to the table and also um, this idea that I had. So that was how um, Miasa came to birth. And what was missing during the time, um, eight years ago when Miasa was formed was definitely, um, you know, being a person with lived experience, there wasn't a movement during that time that was um, formed by uh, people with mental health disorders. Um, so I wanted to do that first um, because I felt really helped when I spoke to another person that could relate, validate, and understand what I was going through. Um, and I and I feel that um, even with you know the many psychosomatic symptoms that I had, especially chronic back pain, that even when someone could relate with, you know, a physical condition, I felt really helped. Imagine if, you know, a lot of other people can relate to a mental health condition where it's not something that you can see with your naked eye. So this was how peer support came to birth. And when I created, um, you know, the peer support initiative uh, in 2016, I didn't know that peer support was evidence-based. You know, I just knew that it helped me, so it could possibly help another person, and that was why I did it. Second, um, what I knew was there wasn't a place that um, provided a holistic approach to recovery. So I proposed the solution to my own teacher, which is our current VP, uh, Ustaz Muhammad Nodaros, and also Dr. Hazli during the time, because that was how my recovery went, right? So I understood that it needed a holistic approach, Spiritual, spirituality was a big component um, to my recovery. And so I proposed that to them. And that was how Journey to Recovery um, came to birth. Um, and then thirdly, I realized that disempowerment is really what kills um, you know, the recovery journey of the person, of the individual. And so empowerment is really what needs to happen. And so what with this platform of Miasa, it really provides um, that empowerment because we allow people to come in. There is a safe space. They can, you know, have a voice. Um, they can do things that they like. They can choose activities and programs that can help them. And we treat them as equals on an equal basis. So providing 
um, you know, autonomy, providing um, liberty, providing that freedom really boosts that self-confidence to peers. And when they're in charge of their recovery, this is when they, they will be able to grow um, in that recovery process and it will go, go uh, in a more effective way. Um, so this is, um, you know, what I saw um, eight years ago uh, before I, you know, formed MIASA. Okay, that's good. Interesting. So I think there's also some misunderstanding um, in, the, in the market right now, right? What's the difference between uh, mental health and mental illness? Like, um, what's that stigma or misconception that's happening in society? Right. Um, actually, you know, we, a lot of times, you know, people use mental health and mental illness mm -hmm. interchangeably, but really it means, you know, the complete opposite, right? Mental health is like physical health. We all have it. Mental illness is an illness, like how physical illness is an illness. So that is, you know, the, the stark difference uh, between the two. But of course, um, there's, you know, much stigma when it comes to uh, mental health disorders or mental illness. Uh, but alhamdulillah, via this pandemic of COVID-19, we are now able, you know, to talk about it in a huge way. We're able to normalize this discussion so much. And, and obviously, you know, everyone today, we are all struggling with, with something. You know, the pandemic hit has really impacted the mental health of many. So now we are able to reduce stigma um, very, very much, uh, alhamdulillah. Thank you. And definitely we see a lot more awareness and a lot more people talking. Definitely. All right, so Kuam, I, I know that you, you take a more intimate route, right? So you uh, volunteer, you do coaching, mentoring, and many of the support services. So what has been your experience when you deal with individuals that have mental health and those that have mental illness? Okay, thank you, Aiza. Um, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, because I'll take this journey since my career as a life coaching, as mentoring, as a mentor, the same time, women from, uh, you know, various background, like even you are mother, this is still career life for you, even you're entrepreneur, you are professional, you're working somewhere. Um, for me, like my experience dealing with um, individual, because um, I work with Miasa, the reason why I jump in because I need to understand better. I need to be close better. Because it's subject of very close to myself. I'm, I'm passionate about helping people out there. So I need to be there to understand. And first thing when I approached Miasa, I started early of the PKP, you know, and um, start being close, you know, start to understand. And I've been exposed. Before we join in, become, before we become a volunteer as a crisis in Miasa, there is a selection, a very selection process to ensure that you are qualified to be there. Either you are advocate or you are peer. Because I think for Anita, I explained that peer support, which is evidence-based to help all, I mean, our client, our peer there. So I'm, the interesting part is um, I'm joining as a wicked advocate at the beginning because of my knowledge and everything. So we've been exposed for uh, PFA. Uh, the module that we need to take is psychological first aid. You will hurt the first aid. Then you must understand the definitions that how you do and don'ts, the rules and don'ts, when you overcome a peer, a client call you saying that, hey, I'm contemplating suicide now. I'm in depression, I'm anxious, anxiety. Of course, this scenario is challenging because it's a matter of saving life. It's a matter of saving life. It's a matter of you to do interventions at the point of time. It's a matter that you need to make the other person on the side that aware that you are there holding their hand, you know, they are close to you because the challenging during the pandemic time, during the PKP, you couldn't reach out the peer because there's moment as crisis team, when you receive a call, there's an emergency call, you need to know one. You do not panic. That's the rule number one. <laughs> do not panic. And rule number two, make sure that there's somebody there around there. They are safe that somebody, third party of family or anybody of friends around there, and you know the locations. And from there, you take step by step, talking to them if they are panic, you need to teach them how to do grounding, how to do deep breathing. Because of course, if they know this, then the situation that you couldn't manage the emotion, because there is a call that mental illness or mental health, because this, this scenario you do not understand when, we, when, when they hit you, when the trigger, the trauma hit you. So we have somebody there holding your hand, it helped to calm down. It helped to, you know, uh, see clear picture. Because um, we receive call uh, from people a lot of like from the age of 12 years old, you know, under 18, 
that we need a, a consent from parents, a consent from the parents to approve us to, to, to help the children. So, and from people from walks of life, from a mother, you know, from a caregiver, because we helping everyone. We should get off. You don't have the history of a mental illness. You don't have the diagnosis. We are there for you, at least because for me, early intervention is a crucial. So if you, if you say that, um, because anxiety can become more common when you older age and it's most common for a man in the age adult. That's we need to aware that because it can be, it can be everybody, it can hit everybody. I think uh, that's a take from me. Dealing with the experience is quite, you know, but I'm glad, Alhamdulillah, I take this, before I took this path because that made me, you know, understand better, be close better. So I know what I'm dealing with, Aiza. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so that definitely we, we see in the news, um, you know, nowadays we see people who take their own life, you know, instead of, uh, and, and I think it's from the lack of not knowing where to go and not having that support group. So especially um, we also see it um, for celebrities, right? Especially the Korean um, pop stars, right? So many of them have, have gone that way. So um, Chikpa Sarima. As a celebrity and an advocate of mental health, from your experience specifically, how deep is the situation? Like, um, is it happening with our famous people? Uh, because we see it happening overseas. So, is it the same in Malaysia? What do you feel about that? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited. Sorry, I couldn't put the background. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit, but that's okay. Um, I uh, just want to go a little bit backtrack there a little bit. Um, I just, if that's okay with you to just give you a little bit of a background on what I had myself with lived experience. So I have a, I studied psychology since back in 1996. It's always been my passion. Actually, my goal was to become a psychiatrist. It wasn't to become a celebrity, but I needed to make a living. I come from a very simple background and I was working two jobs in college in 96 while studying psychology. And um, I got the chance, the break, as they say, to make, uh, to earn a living, to help my family. So in 96, while I was doing two jobs, um, a talent scout saw me. And, and, and from then on, it became 22 years of being a public figure. But while I was a public figure, I continued to upskill. And this goes back to what Dr. Dr. Madeline was talking about earlier, because even though I was doing my degree, I always knew that in the future for Malaysian women, we needed to uh, have the skills to get into the industries rather than just the education, the degree, whatnot. So while I was doing my psychology degree, I continued to do skill sets like teaching English, etc., and uh, becoming a Pilates instructor. Um, and I'm so happy I did all these things because they have given me so much strength today. And I'll explain that to you because it was a coping mechanism for me, like seeking out knowledge and education was actually a way for me to deal with my uh, severe anxiety and depression, which I've had since I was a child, actually, but I didn't know I had it. So even though I was studying psychology, I thought it was just part of my personality, Isa and everyone here, as may some may relate with it. So I've had a lot of lived experience with uh, mental health issues. It's just that I did not become more aware of it until my early 30s. And then I became more aware of it two years ago when I had postnatal depression and I actually got diagnosed and then I had treatment and my my diagnosis was a shock to me because I was like I'm sorry my Ibrahim I'm like this happy person who makes people laugh how could it be but just like Jim Carrey, Ellen DeGeneres, Lady Gaga, um, Sharifa Sakina, Jana Nick who've come out locally and expressed how they've been battling you know it is something that us celebrities and public figures I think act as our personality um, and for me I I what I'm doing now is, as the patron of Nyasa, I just want to spread awareness and share the knowledge that I have um, as a person with lived experience for many, many years. And also, my mother had severe depression and anxiety as well. And I'm also a suicide loss survivor because there's been two suicides in my family on my mother's side. And um, I think these all added up to a lot of trauma. And the way I dealt with it as a child was to develop coping mechanisms such as entertaining everyone and trying to swallow the pain and saying to everyone, I'm fine. And Alhamdulillah, you know, my faith always got me through it. It's always a holistic healing for me. Um, education, adding on skills, 
um, berpegang pada you know um, my spiritual beliefs. Alhamdulillah, even though I was overseas and I studied overseas for many years, I, I never lost that link um, to to God. And I think that got me through. And I never, Alhamdulillah, went down the path of self harm, etc. But I did take on coping skills and coping mechanisms which are socially acceptable, like workaholism, um, exercising too much. I even developed an eating disorder as a result. So these were all my symptoms. And two years ago when I had my daughter, Sophia, Alhamdulillah, I, I was properly diagnosed because I collapsed in my bedroom uh, in 2019, um, three months after I came back after having her. And um, I tried to heal too fast, you know, in the Pantang period, I was like, okay, sorry, Ma, you can do this, you can be super. And I, um, I did too many things. I tried to lose weight too fast. I tried to be that super woman, Malaysian woman who can do everything. And my mind, my soul, and my brain couldn't keep up with my intentions and my coping mechanisms. And I finally reached out to many friends and family, and that's where peer support comes in. And I reached out to my spiritual um, teacher, and I also saw a doctor, and I also had to take medication for a short period of time. And alhamdulillah, today, I am currently enrolled in a course, back to what Dr. Madeline said, and I'm upskilling once again in the area of mental health and also as a life coach, Pinko Emma. So I am also in that direction as part of my healing. So alhamdulillah, I, I, you know, there is hope, I always say, Isa, there's always hope. And when I was on the ground two years ago, gripping the carpet and praying, you know, Allah, please, you know, if this is the end of Rima, please take care of my daughter. Um, I still knew in the back of my head somewhere that there was hope, but thanks, thanks to professional help, my peers and my spiritual strength, it got me through it. But a lot of people aren't as fortunate, aren't as privileged, and don't have the access with the finances or the spouse. And I see that and I understand that. So today I want to help everyone else be able to get help no matter what. Thank you for that. So I think all of us are touched by that story. So if, if I wanted to ask you one more question, right? Thinking about it in hindsight, how would you, like if, if there's um, mothers right now, right? Expecting mothers or people who are that go through the same thing. What, what, what were the symptoms or what were the indicators that maybe people could think about that might uh, alert them to, you know, do something now? How, how would you you know, because everybody feels that they're okay. You know, because they just, you know, as women, I think we just go on. You know, yeah. whatever happens in our life, we're just like, okay, we're the front line. We'll go on, you know, for our kids, yeah. for our husband, right? So how do you yeah. think it's time to to take a step back and, and you know, take care of yourself? You know, women, you know, we're so strong, actually. We're so strong. We're so strong. We're so strong. And sometimes our strengths can be our weakness <laughs> because it doesn't allow us to see when we need help and to ask for help. So kita ni jenis yang macam tak apa, boleh, tahan, go for it, go for it, go for it, I can do this. And tak nak menyusahkan orang lain, we don't want to make life difficult for everyone else. But, you know, healing is within our environment and the community, I believe. Sometimes we don't give the people close to us the chance to even help us. Because we say, no, no, I'm fine, I'm okay. Look, I, look at all my awards, look at all my degrees, look at how I am. Tak tidur tiga, tiga jam je tidur and I'm fine. I've got like so many kids. I'm happy. I'm okay. Don't, don't, don't think I'm weak, you know. So that perception, I had to let go of that. And I started sharing before even a lot of the local celebrities shared. And I started working with Miasa just, you know, as a moderator, as panelist, and just was so happy to support Juan Anita because I could see the passion and I could see uh, what she was doing. And I wanted to come on board and, and today, you know, what I do, Isa, to answer your question, to take care of me is I ask for help. Every time something is not okay, my body, like, you know, that feeling when you feel like, I don't know me anymore. Who am I? What's going on in my life? Why do I feel so, you know, either, and there's different symptoms of mental health issues, you know, it can look healthy and not be, you know, and there's masks and smiling depression as well. 
Um, so it's not all just doom and gloom and orang tu macam kena nampak macam sedih, menangis saja. There's also sejenis uh, kemurungan yang nampak macam semuanya okay. Happy, terlalu happy pula. You know, somebody just died in the family, oh I'm okay. You know, that type of depression that, that people need to be aware of as well in our society and, and, and ask, you know. And vulnerability is what I offer. I offer a lot of myself vulnerably to other women and men that are close to me, my family, and I tell them, I'm not okay. You know, I, I think I need your help. Help me, I ask my husband to help me sometimes. And I ask my friends and peers. And um, Alhamdulillah, I have. But you know, I tell you something, just to end on this before I take up too much space. I, I always believe that the vulnerability will bring us the help that's required. Sama macam doa. Kita berdoa, kita meminta, kita dapat, insyaAllah. Bila tu tak pasti, you don't know when. You've got to reach out and you've got to express your vulnerability or people will see you as strong. And that is a, is, a, is a big thing that I do. Of course, on top of exercise and eating well and taking care of my physical health. And I am in therapy still. Okay, that's good. Thank you so much. Because, you know, people keep telling you, like, fake it till you make it. So if you're not happy, just fake it until you're happy, right? So maybe, uh, Puan Anita, you can tell us about journey to recovery what is that program about like how 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 does how does that help um those who have the disorder and how does it help the caregivers or the family around us all right thank you very much Isa, for the question um okay so journey to recovery actually started um in 2017 january we did it as a physical session in the beginning providing a holistic solution um, to the public so it was medical um spiritual and also um, peer support so providing a lived experience uh, approach together with the other components um, of healing and when we started the journey to recovery um, brainchild, um, it was a big hit because during the time, um, nobody did it, right? Uh, the conversation of mental health was really done by psychiatrists and they couldn't really reach a, a lot of people because it was very much from the medical model perspective. Um, so this is how we are trying to move away um, and bring about the social model, the recovery model, and also definitely the human rights-based approach, which is really lost uh, within psychiatry. Um, so it, it became a huge hit. But what happened was um, Ikim FM um, offered me a, a program uh, which is called Journey to Recovery as well. But what happened was, um, as we know, the mass market are more Malays, right? Uh, Bahasa speaking people. Um, so we did Journey to Recovery for one season and then we um, changed it to an interview format and um, we did it in Bahasa. So the moment we it hit um, um, uh, when we changed it to Bahasa, um, every Sunday at 6 p.m. was when it was aired, and we had listenership of about 250,000. And what, what was really important during the time, obviously, um, is because one, Ikim is known for providing reliable, um, as a reliable source for knowledge, right? Um, Islamic channel in that sense. And so it's very much because in line with Miasa, because Islam, uh, Miasa's worldview is an Islamic worldview, which Islam is for all. Um, a lot of non-Muslims come to Miasa as well for support and for the non-medical alternatives that we provide. Because if you want medical alternatives, you can get it at clinics and hospitals, right? So this is how we are different. Uh, and of course, the other thing is we, via IKIM, because it's a radio program, we were able to reach, you know, the rural areas. So many people in the rural areas had radios, so they were able to listen in and understand more about mental health. And so what happened was we had people across the nation drive, they took flights, came to Miasa for the help and for the support, especially caregivers that felt really helpless frustrated, they didn't see um, that their loved ones were going through, you know, an effective recovery journey. And so they came for the help because then they finally realized, oh, a mental health condition, you can actually recover from it. You know, there is hope, but it has to come from a holistic approach. They didn't know this because a lot of times it was just talking about medication. That was it. You know, every single time going to the psychiatrist talking about medication, you know, what medication to change, you know, um, upping up the dose, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't the conversation of 
a holistic approach one and how do caregivers guide their loved ones in that recovery process so there was a lot of frustration amongst caregivers and they too are prone in getting a mental health disorder as well uh, because you know feelings of frustration uh, frustration hopelessness and then they too have to take off from work you know um, carrying their loved ones because their loved ones are not going through that recovery process because of not getting the treatment that they need see so it becomes that vicious cycle so this is actually the strength of the program and the other advantage of the program was a lot of peers that have uh, reached out to us have told us that you know in the feelings of um, feeling very trapped um, hopeless um, overwhelming anxiety feeling suicidal just driving around in the car and then hearing me talk about it hearing ustas talking about it hearing the doctor talking about it and other peers that we have invited via this program that they felt validated that they felt heard that they felt there was hope we had a lot of people that actually were contemplating suicide but because they heard what we said that was how they reached out for the help you see so there is always hope and and you know be doing um the program journey to recovery and kambara shifa when we translated it to bahasa we ran the program for two years two more than two years actually we did five um episodes of the program and through that program as well was how other stakeholders finally um understood more about mental health and invited Nyasa to come on board um, to really share um, and provide insights. And this was how um, even, you know, the ministry, um, other stakeholders realized the strength of peers providing insights um, in trans into translating it to better treatment, help, and also support. Um, so Alhamdulillah, um, I think this has been very, very powerful. Um, and, you know, sometimes um, peers tells, tell us that when they're in the car and when the show comes on, um, they feel really relieved when their parents are there and their spouse are there to really hear. Um, and then when care caregivers actually reach um, to our place um, at Nyasa to finally understand oh, other people are going through it as well. You know, the struggle is real. The pain is real. You know, the condition is actually real because it's very typical. You know, we are very harsh, very hard on our family members. But, but when, when we actually hear it from others, then we know, OK, it's, it's true and this is our goal. And what can we do to help the person? Um, so this is the strength of Nyasa, the strength of the program, and the strength of peers and people with lived experience. Alhamdulillah. It's wonderful, Anita. Really great job that you guys are doing. So, so I, I see a lot of questions in the chat group. So mainly about how do you know that you're having a problem? So maybe I'll leave that to Tunku Emma because I know that you you talk to a lot of people, right? So how do you diagnose someone like uh, when you first talk to them? How, how do you know that? This is just normal stress or this is something that needs to go further you know how, how would you differentiate that okay Isa, um i cannot diagnose them diagnose only can be done by the psychiatric by the doctor what we did is assessment through our mm. experience through our learning process before i go there let me uh, share you that of course um i'm Coming from the actually by the beginning, um, let me reveal something. I learned to read at eight years old. I have a learning disability. I am dyslexic. So because I seen word in different mirror image, so was it's quite complicated for me. Doctor Mendley, you are the lecturer, then you have a student like this, and I was diagnosed as ADD like three months ago. It's meaning attention deficit disorder. Um, difficulty to focus, difficulty to follow instructions, you know, difficulty to complete tasks, uh, social interaction, all the compressors just re really unique, make you a better person or make you a unique person. Learning um, is really hard for me, especially on academic part. So uh, this experience already, I mean, uh, it took like four, 40 years to, to, to understand the process. Because back then, um, at the time, um, we don't have knowledge about that. I don't know what happened to me. And I become those like, um, people label me um, Bodo, something like that. That's normal that you uh, you, you receive from that. And to the, throughout the journey, I need to develop back my self-esteem. So uh, what happened, Aiza, um, I think I want to go back to when my mother was diagnosed as a cancer, like um, 2012. And this is the way that um, I start to, to, you know, the journey that we need to understand when it comes to 
to cancer, it's going to hit the entire family. It's going to hit your support system. So what happened? Uh, she rec recovering uh, within five years. Uh, I think um, 2012, 2017. Um, but what happened? We failed to recognize something about her when she keep talking about dying. She talking about I'm going to die. I'm going to die. But she already in the recovering process. I don't understand that because we are not aware that there is a mental health or mental illness that she has an issue when we doesn't know that because of the knowledge and the awareness we don't have. And um, I need to bring up about when people always label uh, when you have a mental illness or you're crazy or you depressions, people always relate to your iman. People always say that you're less iman. That's I heard a lot through, through, through my experience, uh, through, you know, um, re review comment from a, a client itself. Um, then I'm wondering, um, during my teenagers year, I wish my mom all the time, when she's the person who always salat tajuk, always write, recite Al-Quran, always zikir all of that. And then, why suddenly, when she had this, she such, suddenly lose her control, couldn't, couldn't manage her emotion. Then we understand that. If people have a cancer, you do not say that they, you know, less iman as well, but suddenly it becomes stigma to you when people have mental health issue, mental illness issue. So this is the time that we need to correct. It's not about iman, you know, it's not about you less iman, but you lose control about that. Then what happened to me when I, Miasa did not, I mean, I did not found Miasa actually, Miasa found me because there were reason I be there at the point of time during during the you know, PKP and everything because I'm there as advocate and within three months I end up become a peer also. So I have two experience here, you know. How is the journey itself? So being in, in, in Miasa, I have a lot of knowledge. That is the question is depending if you know it's easy. If you doesn't know, it's hard for you. So I'm the kind of person who love to try and error. So I need to test the system before I advise a client to do that. The first thing I go is to, of course, um, the clinic, you know, the government clinic. How do I get access to the system? Then how easy is that to be doing? So I do some research. And then because of the PKP and so on, um, they're using online booking. They call it book, book doctor. Book doctor.com, something like that. So, um, so what you do is you need to uh, go to uh, go inside the online, choose your the nearest clinic, and then you can see that uh, you can choose the time, everything, make it appointment. And um, you wanted to have mental assessment, you take that. They can call you, uh, you know the time, go walk in there. So they give you an uh, assessment first. And then after you do the assessment, then only you go to the GP. You need to be consulted by the GP in order for you, either they recommend you to counselor or secretary. It is depending to the result that you have there. Okay, in my conditions, I have no societal thought. I, I'm, I'm not anxious at the point in time. So the question just relate to that. So I fail to be diagnosed at the point of time because the conditions of myself do not qualify me to meet the psychiatry. Even, you know, the point of time when you walk back, when you it getting, um, of course, the early intervention is very important. But if I do not get help because of my condition at the point of time, um, later on, if I give up, I may end up having depressions, having with that. So, um, that is, you know, by trust the system that you know the journey. And to tell, say, to, to say that, uh, Aiza, uh, it's not easy actually to, to be get diagnosed by psychiatry. It's not an easy way. You need to really have the certain process with that. You need to go through that. Then only you can be assessed to psychiatry and on the medications. That's why when we peer call, I always ask, are you on the medications? Are you a diagnosed? Because we know how serious is the problem, how serious are in the conditions then. So um, that's my journey. And I believe that there is a reason why I'm here. The reason why I'm take part in Miasa is in my healing process also. It's the journey for me to, to, to be healed and to heal other people. So... Yes, Aiza. Thank you. Because Graham, I've known you for a long time, right? So I've yeah. always seen you as somebody who is um, one of those go-getters, you know? I, I know that nothing will, will stop you from you know, making <laughs> your dream Surprising. come true. So that's what I've seen. 
So thank you for sharing this um, side yeah, of you. Yeah. yeah, so definitely um, when you were talking about medication, right? So I guess there is an option where you can take a uh, medication to go through your, your depression and things like that. So maybe I would like to ask um, Sarima, like um, how, how is it for you? Like when you go through a therapy and all that, what, what, um, what was your journey like? And then um, did you take medication? Did that help? And also, like, I, think, I think we can relate back to Norlina's question. How do you make your loved ones understand what you're going through? You know, because sometimes um, your, your mother-in-law might be thinking that you're just trying to get attention or something like that. How do you, how do you make that work? Thanks, Aiza. Well, uh, when I first got diagnosed, I can say that for me, Alhamdulillah, you know, I didn't have to go through such a long process like um, Guem explained just now because because I already had educated myself about psychology, depression, and anxiety, and I was aware of it, and I was very interested in the subject since small due to the family history. So I think the key here is education for women so that we are more aware of ourselves and our environment, and that helps us a lot. So I did not actually go for a screening because I already could see all the symptoms that I was having meant that I was having a mental health problem at the time. So I directly went to my GP and I broke down. I was crying in his office and I said, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. And he, he actually looked at me and he said, sorry, mom, I'm so happy that you came to see me today because so many women and so many mothers out there, they don't come. They don't tell me what they're going through. And, you know, we, we can help you now because you, you are being vulnerable enough to express it. So I went on vacation for a very short period of time, very reluctantly, I must say. I was fighting it because my belief was the biopsychosocial spiritual is the ecosystem for your health. And I, I just thought biologically, I do not want to take medication. I, it's not for me. And I will focus on all the other support systems that I had. But for a short period of time, it helped me to cope and to regulate uh, while I absorb the education and assistance from my peers and uh, my environment. And it allowed me time to stay calm enough to understand my condition so that I could further work on it with my therapist, with my spiritual teacher, uh, with being involved in work and doing work with Miasa and other NGOs and being part of the community. That actually is what healed me what healed me was helping others heal. I must say this, and that vulnerability, again, I come back to having compassion for yourself and others helped me to break through all my defense mechanisms and help me to see what I needed to do to get healthy. And um, so it was only for a short period of time. And then after six months, I was able and we left to sort of just, I wouldn't say fly, but I was able to to go out into the world and as I am now, and now I'm even into businesses, et cetera, something I never would have done before if I hadn't sought out the holistic way of getting support and help. So I'm very, how could you say, appreciative and grateful for the experience because I've come out knowing and understanding myself and others more. Now I have more compassion and empathy for people who are going through stuff. So, you know, you need to have a conversation with your loved ones and vulnerable and say, I'm really going through this and this. And of course, seek out the help and the support of other peers and associates like Miasa so that the others can take it seriously. I understand there are many family members who don't take it seriously, who question it, who don't understand what you're going through. And that's where you need the help of associations and professionals to step in so that they can be an intermediate and explain. Thank you, Sarima. That was great. Women rise, right? This is the, what the whole purpose of this session is about. Okay, so I'm going to go through the final round. Okay, the final round of questions. So, um, Anita, um, you have traveled the world doing talks and you have participated in programs and presented papers in global conferences. So in all of your work, what would be that one thing that truly jumps out at you right now, being the most relevant now, for those undergoing mental conditions in the times that we have, right? What would be your main concern today? And you know, what would be the main thing that you would focus on? Okay. Thank you very much, Aiza, for the question. 
There are actually, I, I cannot give you one because I've had three life-changing experiences doing um, this work. Uh, for the information of everyone, um, Yasa not only does advocacy in Malaysia, but we do advocacy globally. We belong to TCI Asia Pacific since 2018, uh, part of the steering committee. Um, uh, I'm on the steering committee. Um, TCI stands for Transforming Communities for the Inclusion of People with Psychosocial Disability. Um, as we speak, we are actually registering um, at Geneva uh, as a global movement. Um, so that is the first um, life-changing experience for me in 2018 when I went to Bali uh, for the roundtable discussion. Um, two of us, me and my secretary, Zakira, during the time uh, where I was one of the panel speakers, they invited me, interestingly enough, to speak about mental health and spirituality. Uh, because Bargavi, the convener of TCI Asia Pacific, um, she heard me speak in one of the um, psychiatric conferences here in Malaysia. And she was really inspired on, um, she said, how brave I was to talk about spirituality uh, in relation to mental health, because not many people spoke about spirituality and mental health during that time. So what happened was when I went to um, uh, Bali, in my session, I was the only one with anxiety disorder. The other three panels had schizophrenia disorder and they are leaders in their respective countries, leading DPOs, uh, Disabled People or People's Organization. So I was really blown away, one, because of that, uh, on how they have gone through that recovery process, how they have embraced hearing voices, because as we know, people with schizophrenia disorder, or for those that don't know, um, they experience hallucinations, delusion, and paranoia. So just imagine, um, I think a lot of times people um, have this perception that when we talk about hearing voices, you think it's a whisper. When we talk about hearing voices, you hear another voice that is not real, the same volume as you're hearing my voice right now. So that is why it is a living nightmare, right? So these peers, you know, leaders in their respective countries, talk so much about embracing, you know, all these various symptoms that they go through and yet advocate and fight for human rights when it comes to mental health disorders. Why is stigma in this conversation very important? Let me just share with you really quickly. It's because these labels and this negative perception is what creates barrier to access for people like us, for people with mental health disorders, because People have the perception that when you have a mental health condition, you know, you're not quite there, you're not able to work, you're not productive, you're weak-willed, you know, you're dangerous, violent, et cetera, et cetera. So the list goes on. So that is why this conversation is so important in providing that insight to allow um, people to understand that, look, even if you're battling those symptoms that can be very horrifying, you can actually treat it, it's treatable. Anyone with a mental health disorder, even however chronic it might be, you can actually recover from it. So this is what the recovery model talks about. And this is what Miasa champions a lot because it talks about we are not our symptom, right? We are beyond our symptoms. So this is what first and foremost, we really need to understand. Um, two, when I was there, we we spoke about UNCRPD. So those of you that work within the disability movement, you will really um, you know, resonate with this a lot. So United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disability is not about, you know, in Malaysia, we talk about, you know, signs, symptoms, mental illness, mental health, you know, I have a mental health condition, what do I do about it? The, the true and real question is, how do I include a person with a mental health condition in society? Because this is what we're not aggressively working at and right now because of the pandemic hit we are able to see these gaps these gaps are exposed even more because people with mental health condition let me tell you there are seven categories of pwds persons with disabilities but because mental health is not visible to the naked eye it's difficult for people to relate definitely can't relate you can't understand it it's difficult for you to help because when you don't understand you don't have the knowledge for example right so the real question is how do we really include us um, in society? And this is where we need to talk about having a sustainable model. And this is very much what Miasa talks about and what we are working and heading towards, right? Which I will talk about a little bit. We have a chance later on. So that is um, what happened. So that is why we talk about stigma a lot, um, you know, 
and inclusion a lot. Two is when I went to Trieste, and this is a story that I really need to share with everyone because it's an experience that I take to my grave. You know, um, with um, going to Trieste, um, you know, I was actually uh, invited by Dr. Kadir. Um, and when I, you know, was invited to speak on this topic, you know, this is a topic that creates a lot of, um, people feel very uncomfortable when we talk about this topic because, you know, we don't talk about this topic publicly. So what is this topic about? It's about coercion. It's about restraint, seclusion, forced treatment, forced admission, forced medication. So I was invited to talk about this. Can you imagine? So I went to Trias talking about no restraint. That was the topic of my presentation and Miyasa's work works. Dr. Kade told me, you've got nothing to worry about. Dr. Hazra, who is one of our other um, big um, advisors and supporters, told me, she said, you know, Anita, when you go to Trieste, you are going to feel so supported. Let me tell you, you have nothing to worry about. So this was exactly what happened when I went um, to Trieste. 400 people, let me tell you, ages of my grandfather, 90% um, of them, um, you know, we only had, you know, a handful of people that were under the age of 40. Really championing talking about what we champion at Miasa, you know talking about the recovery model human rights based approach closing down mental institutions where many countries have closed down mental institutions so this was what happened and so um i think when you know what is so important is with the trieste model uh, franco bagzalia let me tell you he is the founder um he is uh, a very well-known progressive um, psychiatrist during the time who closed down all mental institutions in Italy. And this is what he said, liberty is therapeutic, right? So this is what inspired the closure of mental institutions in Italy, because he said it's impossible, you know, to have therapy in a place of seclusion, in a place where people are oppressed. We must ensure liberty and freedom in the beginning and work with the person as equals on an equal basis. So in Trieste, there are no locked doors. It's an open system. 24 seven community mental health services, even their forensic ward, let me tell you, there are no locks. It's an open forensic ward. And how is this, how did they make it happen? Today, let me tell you, for the past 20 years, they have a suicide ratio that is declining and it has declined by 50% guys, just by treating people with lived experience, people with mental health conditions as equals providing them freedom, providing them liberty, providing them choices. And, you know, this is one, one place, one experience that I feel truly, um, you know, it was a huge eye opener, truly inspired. Um, and the other, the, the third one uh, was actually in Malaysia itself when, you know, Miasa, um, we did a, uh, what is called the International Mental Health Recovery Conference followed by the Malaysia stakeholder meeting. And um, it was so interesting in 2019 when we did this and I, I invited a lot of our uh, members from TCI. And although I briefed them a couple of times, but during the conference, they told me they were, they were surprised. They said, um, you know, Anita, I can't, we can't believe that, you know, in Malaysia, the discussion is still, you know, calling it mental illness, because when you talk about illness, you're labeling it, right? And it's very much framed within the medical model. And we're still, um, you know, calling people with mental health condition as patients, um, still talking about signs and symptoms. So they were really shocked at the moment uh, during the time. And so because of this, um, we really, um, wanted to talk more about solutions. And it was then followed by a Malaysia stakeholder meeting where the five resolutions that were agreed upon, one of it, Alhamdulillah, very, very happy that it was closing down mental institutions. Because let me tell you guys, five years ago when I spoke about it, I spoke about it a lot. There was a lot of backlash from you know many of the psychiatrists uh, fraternity, of course, because you, know, you don't, you feel that, um, you know, it's people need to be, you know, locked up or uh, restraints still happen when it's not um, helpful. There's no evidence to support that restraints is actually helpful. There are data to support that restraints are actually harmful. Um, so I think these were really three um, things, um, life changing experiences for me that I really hope that eventually in Malaysia, it can become a real reality where you know all mental institutions will be closed, you know, at a national level. So this is my hope. 
we still practice coercion in Malaysia. We still practice forced treatment, admission, medication, you name it. Uh, but hopefully through the advocacy of NIASA, not only Thank you. in Malaysia, but internationally, uh, we, we are able to pull this through. So, so we need a loud voice. Um, I initiated the National Alliance of Mental Health. We have various um, groups from you know the PWDs in it with the various NGOs, um, social enterprises, um, higher learning institutions to hopefully materialize this. And the pandemic hit has definitely helped to bring um, this uh, conversation closer. And we're now closing in, hopefully, inshallah. All right. Thank you very much, Anita. Okay. So now I'm just going to go through the last two questions. Um, one is to Kuem. Um, since you volunteer at NIASA, right, and I've been speaking to many folks, uh, um, who, who comes to talk to you? Are they men or women? And then what, what kind of help do they ask for the, the most common help? Okay, um, Aiza, that's why we, we, why we are here today. Why we have so many events about women and women rise, women empowerment, women everything. Definitely, if I look at the fact, of course, the populations are women more than men, actually. And to answer the questions, um, if I'm not mistaken, through the uh, racial database, it's like uh, women, 30.8%, something like that, versus a man, 27%. And through my experience itself, of course, I definitely receive a lot of call from a woman, from a mother, you know, from a daughter. And once in a while, I get receive uh, from, from men. Um, and then um, it's a various kinds of issue, uh, that issue, even relationship issue, you know. Um, and um, so because we, we, we want to believe that, I mean, the intervention during that time, always what, what, uh, what uh, common support in day six always there is from, from, not even from the mental health support. Also, is involved on the providing food, shelter, you know, employment support program. Because we have about uh, 33 agency involved for social synergy model. Even Miasa also have the uh, essential food to provide for the peer, for the clients. And also that uh, the basic need. Because recently, um, I'm not only dealing with um, mental health uh, issue, but at the same time, the request for the food. Because in this challenging time, they say, um, I'm so stressed and anxious because I don't have food for tomorrow, or I don't have shelter uh, to live. This is our part to when Miasa come, it's not only to, to, you know, to address one issue, we come with the comprehensive, complete, that to ensure that our peer, our client have everything in it in their life, even employment support program. We work with agency, with government, you know, to help each other. You want to talk about that, you can go to AKPK. Because during that time, they don't know how to reach out. This is why we are here. Um, you know, when they come, they need a guide. Even Miasa is about mental, mental health, support, associations about mental health. But it compresses everything, complete everything in the whole. So we doing Miasa also, I think Juanita doing the best of where he can to address the issue there. Because it can be, you know, compounded, compounded, the challenges can be compounded, even, um, and then the stigma in be you working in the place when your employer do not understand, your colleague do not understand, it, you know, sometimes it affect your punya quality of work, it affect your career. Uh, then you need to find a different employment who, or if they are running program, the better understanding, they help to support your punya employee. So that is the kind of support that we provide. And, you know, a bit, gender, of course, definitely. That's why we need to empower women more. I think that Dr. Mendley itself addressed a lot of, of women punya because the, 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 the pressure that society gave, you know, the, the, the culture and everything like um, Cik Ponsarima said that when people ask you, are you okay? It's for, hard for you to, to be honest, to say that um, we always pretend that I'm okay because of the labeling, the stick. But I think all this um, coming up with the small, small thing that add up to bigger issue, to the stress. Because we so fear that people are judging us. You know, we still are at that scope. But I believe uh, when COVID-19 hit, I heard that a lot of people talking about it. A lot of people address the issue. Then I hope 
because whenever they announce PKP, we can notice that the flooded in the call, the detention there, the pressure there, uh, sort of life coming, men, women, but yeah, that is it, the scenario, the scenario again, Aiza. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna ask um sorry Mana, let's let's um uh, let me ask you, right? So now I know that you're investing um in special needs education and um what what brought this about? Like you are also the patron of Miasa. So what what made you um do this specifically? Uh well I wanted to uh, when when Juanita asked me to be the patron, I felt like it was a natural progression based on what I've been doing with Miasa and doing, um, working closely with them. And also I'm very, very much, very passionate about the zero coercion uh, that is trying to be attained. And because, you know, just listening to what she mentioned just now, um, I have a family member who was forced into an institution. Um, and he, I believe, it wasn't necessary and other forms of support and therapy could have been given, but the whole family didn't agree and he was pushed into an institute and he came out in and out, in and out, and I had to fight for his rights for many, many years. Um, but ultimately I didn't have a say in the end. So I definitely would love to see the closing down of all mental um, hospitals and, and whatnot and the likes. So I'm very passionate about supporting that. And zero stigma society is something that I, I, I love and I wish for and I wish for it since I was young because I couldn't speak to anyone about what I saw going on in my family, what I saw going on in myself. I didn't know who to talk to. I malu, malu not treating around what I was going through. I was embarrassed to tell people I had an eating disorder when I was young. I was embarrassed to tell people after I gave birth that I was having thoughts about you know, what, what would happen if I died? I was malu. I said, like, orang can tengok kita macam dia ni kenapa? You know, so it, I, I just pray for that to happen. And and I just wanted to add also that, that, you know, doing the businesses that I'm doing and the investing that my, myself and my husband decided to do because we want to help. This is part of us trying to help other women and other men in our society because if one part of society is not well, it affects every one of us, the caregivers, the employers, the, 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 the entire country, the entire world, it's the collective consciousness. If I'm not okay, you're not okay and vice versa. So I definitely believe in, in, in working together, especially in the business aspect of things. So uh, we're working with a, a special education, special needs education center because we want to see the parents supported uh, mental health wise. And we want to see the children even a level, level uh, you know, going in uh, with uh, the mainstream schooling system. And we'll, I'm, I'm also going to invest in a mental health center, which focuses on holistic, holistic uh, therapy and helping people to flourish. So, you know, as a woman, I think I have this, this, this is like, you know, something that I, I need to do. I'm 43, I have a daughter. And I feel like I want her to grow up in a society in Malaysia where she feels that she is able to flourish, not just with a degree, not just with a healthy body, but with a healthy mind so that she can contribute and give back to society and have a healthy family herself. And I think that's the core, that's the root core of where we need to go. And I was listening to Dr. Madeline talk earlier again, and it's, it's about education and, and not just the degree and the papers, it's, it's empowering ourselves. So that's what I want to do as a business investor for other women out there and other men, because we need men. We need them to understand and help us in the process. I'm not a feminist. A lot of people will be shocked. They're like, what? What do you mean? No, I believe we all have our part to play. You know, there's no one better than others. And yes, you know, like Dr. Madeline said, the men will come in at certain areas and be more dominant. But hey, you know, we also can have areas where we come in and be dominant too. We can take our stance and we can empower ourselves like we're doing today. Look at us. It doesn't mean we're man bashing. We need the collaboration of the community to come together. So my husband is a man, obviously, and he wants to work with me to help other businesses. And he supports me as a patron of Nyasa. He's so happy that I'm doing that. He always says, what can we do, Sayan? What can I do? Can I do anything? You know, I'm too shy. I, I don't know how to speak like you. I said, it's okay, Sayan. We can help in our own way. And we do what we can in society. And just to add to that, I thought, I, I continue therapy myself. It never ends. Self-growth never ends. 
You don't go to the doctor sekejap or a few months couple and then that's done. It needs to be continuous, like a peer support, circle, groups, you know, building a life for yourself, structuring your life in a way that supports and serves you. Doesn't serve others only, serves you also. Because if you are pouring from an empty place, what can you give? Betul tak? So kita kena jaga diri kita, kesihatan mental, physical juga. And it's like what Kuem said earlier, you know, if you have a, a condition like cancer or whatnot, everybody flocks to you. They kesian dia, diabetes are kesian dia. You know, and if a person with diabetes had, or a person with epilepsy crashed the car into a wall one day because they had a fit in the car, for example, do people look at the society and say, eh, dia ni mati sebab epilepsy, tak cukup iman. No. So why should we do the same for people who 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 experience mental health conditions and illnesses or or you know attempt suicide? So I definitely am am in support and I really hope to see the decriminalization of suicide in Malaysia for that purpose too, so that we can ask for help, we can flourish as a society. So please feel free, everyone here, to reach out and contact me on my social media um, platforms as well if you're interested in the business aspect of of things i'm here all right thank you that was very inspiring definitely okay i'm just gonna end it okay this is the final thing i just want one answer for everyone okay so if you think about um mental health and you think about what you want to do what is that one word one word that you use um you know to to inspire yourself and inspire people to go forward so for Anita, what's inclusion. one word inclusion Inclusion, excellent. QM. Knowing. Knowing. <laughs> All right. And Sarima. I would say hope. Hope. All right. That was wonderful. So we have um, inclusion, knowing, and hope. So excellent. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful panel. Um, it's a little bit... Um, you know, it's a very serious topic. And I think um, what we'll do after this is that we're going to swap the the agenda a little bit. So we're going to do some fun stuff, give out some free gifts so that we can just get ourselves back up. So, but I thank you very much um, to Puan Anita, to Tunku Emma, and of course to Chip Puan Sarima for spending the time today with us. And we truly appreciate the time spent. And hopefully, you know, it, it gives um, a greater hope to Malaysia as a whole, and then we can be more understanding towards each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone, for Inshallah. listening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much.